Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Foot Traffic. I am getting to introduce you today to McCall Jones. McCall, I'm so excited to have you here today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to serve your people. Oh my goodness. And I love that we're on video right now because I can already just, oh, first of all, I bet you can hear McCall's energy, <laughs> okay? You don't even have to see her to know that it's amazing. Oh, um, but you. I was just saying, before we jumped on live, I was just saying to McCall how I tell people, you need to be on video. You need to be on video. And I've been drilling that in your heads for so long, but I haven't really said, you know, here's what we need to do when we're on video. Besides the the call to action, the monetization, let's talk about keeping people long enough on your channel or your Instagram handle or whatever you've got going on to actually hear the call to action and all of that good stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, it's, so I think most video marketing, uh, they do, they focus on um, exactly what you're saying. They even focus on it. When they get to the content, the fact that you're telling people to even put a call to action, yes. that means you're way ahead of the game. <laughs> people are like, focus on keywords, focus on yes. making sure that it shows up in search results. So this is a whole new concept. Yes, it is. So first of all, you tell us actually, before we even dive into charisma hacking, tell yeah. us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey. Like what has that looked like over the years? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I grew up as a child performer. Uh, what I mean by that is from the time I was eight years old on, um, I was performing in front of audiences. My first uh, 20,000 audience was when I was eight, uh, audience of 35,000 when I was 11. Um, I was on stages all the time. Uh, and then I started acting when I was a teenager, did a couple motion pictures. Uh, I was in high school musical. Um, I was, you know, a dancer and all of these things. So, uh, I grew up as this child performer, but I had this incredible anxiety that, mm. uh, just was so, was so difficult to deal with. And when you're a performer and you have performance anxiety, um, those, <laughs> those two things don't really go together very well. Yeah. And I figured out, you know, if I don't figure this out, I'm going to die. So, uh, the weird thing was crowds didn't stress me out. It wasn't the number of people, but it was the fear of rejection, even from one person. Mm. And even with small crowds, you know, of five or six people, I would have the exact same anxiety as if it was a crowd of 35,000 people. So, um, the first way that I decided to measure if I was doing a good job or not, because I don't know if any of you guys have experienced this, but when you go on video or when you go on stage, you kind of black out and you don't really know mm. how you do until you get off and then you are, you know, you have to wait to watch the video back or something like that. So I would go, uh, on stage, I would kind of black out, not really know how I did. And then I would get off stage and I would count the number of people. And this is when I was a very little girl, I would count the number of people that would compliment me. Mm. And if it was a higher number than the performance before, it was like, Oh, I did a great job. This was such a great thing. And yeah. if it wasn't, then I would, you know, have this incredible insecurity and anxiety that would come mm -hmm. from that. And, um, one time I was performing, it was the Steve Young benefit or Steve Young retirement benefit cruise. Uh, he was this big football player who played for the San Francisco 49ers. And I was on the program with Donnie Osmond and I was nine and I was backstage, which really it was a boat. So it was like this very small area. And, uh, I started to, you know, have my ritualistic panic attacks about yeah. worrying about going on this stage in front of these people. And all of a sudden, Donny Osmond being the amazing star that he was kind of pulled me out of that. And he was interacting with his audience in a way that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. And I was a good performer. Like I, I knew, you know, the things to practice, uh, before I got on stage and different things like that. But watching Donny Osmond do this, um, instead of being in my head about, you know, what if I mess up or yeah. will these people like me or do they like the way I look or all of these different things. I started logging in my brain, the different things that he was doing. And I was like, Oh, I could do that. Oh, look at the way he does this with his hands. Look at the way he does this with his face. Look at how he walks around the boat this way. And all of a sudden I had this checklist of things. So that's really when charisma hacking started is yeah. I started creating these checklists of, you know, scientific principles that I didn't know or frameworks back then of ways that audiences would respond to certain things. And, um, you know, over my life of performing that when I got into acting, you know, I applied the same principles. It was okay. What's on the checklist. So when I would get off stage or out of an audition, I could then go through my checklist and know if I succeeded or not. So I was like, okay, uh, I applied it to auditions, you know, with acting and being on stage and doing voiceover work and all this stuff. And then when I was 18, um, I got fired from an acting job for being too fat. 
And it was, I, I, you know, had this incredible like depression. I had just been dumped all this stuff. And then I was fired from this job. Um, and I decided I never wanted to be on camera again. Mm. And at that moment I had, you know, this entire toolbox and lifetime of experience, um, you know, 10 years at that point of this very intense experience and expertise that I was no longer using. And it was yeah. devastating to me. And I felt like I had this creative itch that I wasn't scratching. And um, a little while later, I had an actress come to me and ask her if I could help her with an audition. And this, I promise, is getting to the entrepreneurial part. <laughs> and she, she was like, can you help me with this audition? And I was like, yeah, but we have to do it my way because I would in no way want to be the reason why somebody would fail because then all of that anxiety would come back. Right, I was so, going to say, now a whole nother snowball of that. No way. Oh my gosh. I was like, I'm not going there. So I did, I helped her and I used the exact same frameworks that I had used and they worked. And I did before after videos to make sure that yeah. I was making a difference and then word got out and I started teaching this. So with, you know, the first 18 years of my life, I, um, I perfected the art of being in front of people. And then for the next, you know, almost 10 years of my life, um, I perfected the art of teaching the art of being in front of people. Yeah. So then when I went to Funnel Hacking Live in January, uh, I showed up as a civilian, not as a funnel <laughs> hacker. Uh, funnel Hacking Live is this big internet marketing convention. And I was there to see my sister-in-law speak. And uh, I walked around and I saw all of these entrepreneurs on video, on stage, trying to network, um, trying to do all of these things. And they were, they were not crushing it. And I would meet them before or after I would see them do these things. And their personality was completely different. And they were very engaging and they were entertaining and they were these warm presences. And then they would get on video or on stage or somewhere and it would go away. And mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, if these people only had what I know, then their businesses would grow and they would be able to serve these people. They would get people to listen uh, and they would be, yeah, they would be able to serve such a higher number of, of humans. So yeah. charisma hacking was born and it's been six months and I love it. <laughs> okay. And here's the best part. So I, I got to experience you inside of like this online course that I was in. Um, and you just blew me away. And not Thank only you. were you just saying like, Oh no, try this or try that. You would say, let me show you how this person actually did do this thing that I'm talking about. And I could start to understand like, Oh wow, there are these checklists. There are these things. And as somebody as type A as me, like I just am in love with checklists. So when you're hearing, when I hear you say that, I'm sure my audience who's probably very similar to me as well yeah. is like, perfect. Just give me the checklist. Tell me what I need to do and I'm going to do it. So to kind of recap, like charisma hacking is truly just watching somebody that you like that you're entertained by and kind of studying almost like you do as an athlete, you go back and you watch the game. Like what did they do? What did they do wrong? What did they do right? And then how do we model? Same thing when it comes to video. Yeah. So charisma hacking, it kind of has a, a couple step process. The cool thing um, is that it literally is for anybody. So there are people who are already on video who are like, I need to find my voice yeah. or I just need to get my numbers up. So when you look at analytics, when you look at the back end of your video, when you see a drop off rate or when people bounce out of your videos, uh, you want to know why. And with mm -hmm. charisma hacking, we can go through and we can say, okay, this is exactly what was happening. Here's why people weren't engaging. And that's how we fix that. With with people who are very first starting out, uh, the principles of modeling after other people is very, very big, but it doesn't just have to be people who are crushing it in your niche. It can be anybody who you feel is entertaining. And mm -hmm. it's really important, the you part of that, because everybody has different tastes right. and it's kind of like Tupperware. There's, there's a top of a Tupperware to every bottom of a Tupperware and they fit together perfectly. So like there is a voice for every audience. You just, you have to make sure that you are, uh, you have a, a sustainable publishing model with yeah. being yourself as well. So yes, you absolutely model it after other people. The other thing that we do in charisma hacking is we say, what is the most engaging version of yourself? Is it mm. when you're talking to your spouse, when your best friend, when you're talking to your dog, uh, whatever you're doing in order to be the very most engaging version of yourself. And mm. is that the same person when you're on camera and 99.9% .9 of the time people say no. And then I follow that question up with, okay, if you were the same person as you were when you were with your husband, when you were with your wife, when you're with your best friend, would you sell more, have raving fans? Would you be able to charge more? Would your message get out there 
more? You know, would Mm -hmm. people like you more? And every single person says, absolutely. Yes. So what we're able to do is yes, we're able to charisma hack other people who are better than us. And that's a huge part of it, but we're also able to charisma hack ourselves and say, okay, what are the very best parts of my personality and why are they leaving? How can we bring those back? with, uh, with charisma hacking, how can we bring them mm-hmm. onto the screen? How can we bring them onto the stage, onto a podcast to make sure that we are truly the very best versions of ourselves, the most right. engaging versions of ourselves with this sustainable publishing model. Yeah. And I think actually even bringing up podcasting, I think it's more important to have that charisma while you're doing just audio because there's not, they can be distracted so many places. So if you have a very monotone voice and it's one level, it's going to be really, really hard to stay engaged listening to them. Yes. So this is, this will, will give your audience like a little bit of gold okay. here. So with, uh, with audio, especially what you want to think about is a meditation app. The purpose of a meditation app is to help you zone out, right? It's to help you kind of block it out. Sometimes even to put you to sleep, it's very right. relaxing and it should fade into the background. We want our audio and video to be the opposite of that. So if you look at the principles that go into a meditation app, it's very soothing. There are no dynamics. It's very monotone. It only goes up one or two notes. There's no loud parts. There's no real soft parts unless they're fading into the background. There are no dynamics in that. We want those to fade into the background. So if we take the scientific principles and we apply them to audio and we say, okay, what's the opposite of that? We have what are called vocal pattern interrupts. And we say, okay, how many times a sentence do we need to interrupt our audience to make our audio untune outable because if all of a sudden we were talking like this and I was like yes Stacy thank you so much for having me this is so exciting to be here it doesn't matter what I'm doing with my face <laughs> if my voice is like that people are like okay I don't want to listen to this chick yeah. right but making sure that your voice is dynamic with your pitch mm-hmm. meaning it goes higher and lower making sure that it goes slower and faster that you're hitting your words harder and softer there are all of these things that you know a lot of people ask me well could introverts do this if I'm so shy I'm not a spaz like you would this work for me and if you can be louder or softer with your voice, which everybody can, if you can be faster or slower, if you can go higher or lower, then literally anybody can do these things, which is so cool. Well, and I like how before you were talking about the difference in you meet somebody in the hallway and they're like, Oh my goodness, this is amazing. And then you watch them on camera and they're kind of like that, like you said, monotone, very quiet, shy. I mean, sometimes it's the opposite too. Sometimes they're trying so hard on camera that they're this massive personality and then you meet them in person and you're like, wait a minute. Like there shouldn't be a big disconnect between you on camera and you in person. Because I mean, the goal here is that eventually the people watching you on camera will see you in person and you want to make sure you're you're the same, that they're not thinking uh, this was a bait and switch here, right? Absolutely. So that's also where it comes in with like, yes, you can model after other people, but making sure um, you create. So I have every single one of my clients and charisma hackers at the very beginning, we create what's called a character description and people, if you're listening to this, go create your character descriptions right now. What you want to do is you want to frame out as if you are casting a movie, but it was of yourself. And you want to write down everything that's important for you to show your audience and the parts of your personality that you love the most. We want to make a 3D character. We want to make a 3D version of you that you feel is very true to your personality. Then every single one of those things we make into a checklist. So it's like, if you want to be empowering, it's larger movement. It's more rapid pace. It's a higher tone in your voice. There are all of these different things. If you want to be more vulnerable, then it's a little bit softer. It's a little bit more with a whisper. It's a little bit more fluid of the movement. Your eyes are a little bit squintier. There are literally formulas for every single thing that you want to be on camera and that you want to um, show of your personality. So making sure that, like I said, you charisma hack yourself as well, that you're like, okay, Mm -hmm. I, I am engaging people like me, people believe in me and the people who believe in me the most, who am I when I'm with them? And if I can be that same person, I will find an audience that matches my sustainable publishing model. Because like you said, if you're not yourself on camera, that will only last so long before you get sick of that person. And you're like, Oh, I hate that person. I never want to be that Mm -hmm. person again. Yeah, absolutely. Now, when we're talking about charisma hacking, where are we starting? Like, how could somebody listening today go, I'm going to try this today? Like, what would be the first step they would take? Uh, so I love it. I mean, you can, you can always join my stuff, but if you want charisma hacking is a movement people, you can do this by yourself. So the very first step to charisma hacking is being a very observant and intentional 
person, uh, the first thing that you want to do is you want to notice, um, you can do this with movies, you can do this with commercials, but especially if you're trying to get into an online space, when you're watching or listening or, um, yeah, watching or listening to any video or any audio and it grabs your attention or it keeps your attention for longer than a minute, ask yourself why yeah. literally sit there and be like, okay, I'm watching this person and I haven't clicked out of this. We are in a world full of distractions and full of attention things that, that are trying to distract us from what we're doing, right? That are trying to get us to click on those. So if somebody earns and keeps your attention, there's a reason and there are things that they're doing in order to do that. So you'll start to develop a taste for what you like mm -hmm. and then what you want to be on camera. So if you're sitting there and you're like, okay, I'm listening to Stacey's podcast and she's a freaking rock star ask yourself why be like, okay, what is she doing with her voice? What is she doing? If you're watching video with her face, what is she doing with her arm movement? What is she doing with her relationship to the camera? Is she looking on camera? Is she looking off camera? Is she moving her arms fast? Is she moving her arms slow? Is she going up and down with her voice? Does she get loud at certain parts, right? Find out why you like somebody. You literally can sit there and be like, Oh, I've been listening to this podcast for a couple minutes now. What is so engaging about it? And then ask yourself, what would they have to do for you to leave? What would have to happen for them to completely turn you off of that? And then you write those down too, as like things I don't like. The other cool thing is if you're watching something and you immediately click out of it, then go back to it and be like, oh, what did I not like about this video? What did not grab my attention? And you want to stay away from those things. Yeah. By just being observant, you can start to charisma hack people around you, which is so fun. Well, and I feel like I am that natural observer. I can't go into a store or a restaurant or have a server wait on me without me giving my husband like the 411 of what he should not have done and how I love the way they did this. And I mean, it, that's just how I am. And if you aren't like that, I really want you to start thinking, I need to start observing more, right? Yeah. Um, we call this like friendly stalking in the online space. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so, yes. So go on Instagram and see who have you been following and what, why do you keep following their stories and what are they doing that's getting you excited and there and, and coming back day after day to watch them before they go away in 24 hours. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. Yeah. It's also, um, with, with finding who you like, you want to make sure that if they're doing something over and over again, that's why you're attracted to that specific person. You know what I mean? If it's, if it's not an ad that like passes, if you're following a specific person, they are doing something over and over again that you are attracted to. So finding those patterns in people will really help you as well. Oh, so good. Now I feel like when people want to know about video, they're like, okay, what camera do I buy? What ring light do I need? What microphone? How important is, I mean, when you're rating all of this, you're rating yeah. the, the equipment, how you are, the strategy, all of that. Where does this all come into play? Is one more important than the other? Do you need them? Are they equal? What does that look like for you? So I would say it kind of depends on your brand. And I know that that's okay. kind of an all encompassing answer, but, um, I usually use a kind of a wide array of things. The cool thing about the trends right now in video are most Facebook ads, which if you remember an ad is what people are dumping money into to get people to come into their business. The trend in Facebook ads right now is literally to film them on an iPhone so that it looks like they're FaceTiming yes. somebody. Because uh, there is a space that's called intimate space. It's the space between zero and 18 inches away from your face. And very few people enter this intimate space. So if you can enter somebody's intimate space through camera or where you would be holding your phone, uh, it automatically breaks down a couple walls with your audience and it makes them trust you more. So if all you have is an iPhone, if all you have is a smartphone and you're like, oh, I want to start on video, but, and you're using the excuses that mm -hmm. I don't have the camera. I need. I don't have the ring light. I need all those kinds of things. I can tell you the most important part of video is being engaging. Once you have the content, once you know what you want to say, you want to make sure that you are engaging because you can take a cell phone, face a window and have great lighting and have video that people will watch. Another trend is with Facebook lives. A lot of times it is on a phone. It feels more intimate. So if anything, starting your brand on a more intimate level with people and having them feel like they're a part of your everyday lives by just using a phone is a fantastic place to start. Then as you get into, you know, the more professional side of things, when you get into course creation, right. when you get into uh, trainings and filming things like that, then yeah, 
invest in some lighting. That's awesome. Get a good camera. That's perfect. But you should know that your content should not be waiting for your equipment. Yeah, absolutely not. I agree. And I feel like get started with your phone. I mean, I use my phone for 99% of my stuff. Okay. When I do my course creation, I use my MacBook Pro camera. I mean, I'm not even, awesome. I'm not even using like anything crazy. I do so much video and I'm still getting, and I'm facing a window. It's actually rainy out. So I do have my ring light on, but I'm facing a window because normally that's all I use. Yeah. So I do think we, we tend to think, but I don't, I'm not, I don't have this yet. I'm not ready for it yet. And the only way you're going to get ready is just by starting and then do you recommend going back and watching yourself? Yes. Oh my gosh. Okay. And it's so painful. Every single <laughs> client that I have, we do before after videos. So at the very beginning of when I start working with them, I'm like, okay, you know, we either have the intro video, if they do it in the Facebook group or, uh, with my one-on-one -on -one clients, I'm like, okay, send me your origin story. Send me a before video of your origin story. And then we go back so that we can measure. So yes, measuring for, uh, improvement purposes, super important, but every single video that I ever film, I always go back and watch because there's always things that you can learn. There's yeah. always that you can do better. There's always things, especially if you're on an interview, that it'd be like, oh, what did Stacy do there? I totally want to do that. That was so cool that she did that. Or if I'm like, oh my gosh, I was such a spaz there, I probably <laughs> shouldn't do that again. Right? You have to be very yeah. kind to yourself because you you will hate watching yourself on camera at first. But when you look at it analytically and you're like, oh, what am I doing with my voice? What am right. I doing with my face? What am I doing with my hands? If you can make it a checklist of things, then you don't have to hate yourself every time you watch yourself on camera. And you can be like, oh, how can I treat this? like an improvement exercise. Absolutely. Yeah, watch your videos. Okay. <laughs> it is painful, but I do agree. Watching them, even listening back to the podcast, one time I was doing this weird thing with my mouth that I didn't know I was doing. And there was this like clicking sound and my editor, like nobody was telling me because they were like, well, that's your voice. No, no. I'm like definitely doing something extra that I don't need to be doing. And nobody told me. And then when I heard it, I immediately realized I've got to get rid of that noise. So yeah. it's funny how you just don't realize what you're doing until you go back. Same yeah. thing with, um, I feel like I'm, I, I was a dancer. So growing up, like we knew you smile. And then I was a judge for dancing. And as a judge, yeah. I was trained, you smile at the dancers. Like they don't want to look at a judge you know, so to me, I'm naturally smiling on camera, but a lot of people aren't, and they don't know that. Yeah. Um, I once read this statistic, like smiling is better than wearing makeup. Like it literally enhances your face more than makeup yes. can possibly enhance your, your, your beauty. So definitely think about things like that. And I think going back and watching, you'll go, Oh, wow. I look mad. I look angry. I do not yeah. look like I'm here to present this amazing offer or whatever it is you're doing. So the other crazy thing too, I'm getting into all the sides. You gotta like stop me because I'm such a geek on this. But the other cool thing about uh, a smile, even if you're only using video, even if you're trying to get into a podcast, mm -hmm. is if you listen to what a smile does for your voice. I taught voice yes. lessons for years and it does what's called brighten your sound. So you literally sound friendlier, you sound happier, you sound more positive if you smile. So if you're just listening or if you're watching this, you can hear it. And I'm like, hi, my name's McCall. And all I do is change the shape of my mouth and I go, hi, my name's McCall. It completely brightens yes. the sound. It completely changes it. So it yes, sounds more energetic. Audio. Yes. Yeah, really. So cool. Okay. I love this. This is why I brought you on. I'm like all this gold. I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, okay. And there were some things that you, when I was watching you at first and you were saying like the getting intimate. So when you go in 18 inches, what is a way that you would do that? And it wouldn't feel weird or awkward. Like how do you all of a sudden get closer to the camera and come back? Like what is oh, something you absolutely. would do with that? So, um, if you think about when you're naturally talking to someone, mm -hmm. obviously we're enhancing that because we talked about this yes. intimate space, but you don't just stand there very stiff and at arm's length away from them, right? As you're interacting with them, you are leaning forward and leaning back. So making sure, um, if you're filming on a phone, your hand should be your camera. Your hand should be an extension of the rest of you. So okay. a lot of times I will literally bring my phone closer mm. and farther away from my face, using it as like a zoom in method. Uh, with just being on camera here, if you're using a computer, just like leaning forward and then leaning back very subtly, you can do it subtly at first, especially right. if you're intimidated by it. You're like, ah, they're gonna see my nose hairs. Like you just have to <laughs> lean forward and then you lean back and it will make it feel a little bit more natural. Then as you get to like the spastic place, you'll see on all my Facebook lives, I'll like go really close to the camera and like do goofy things. And it creates kind of that intimate space Sometimes it's also like a funny thing, like a comedic right. relief thing. So making sure it's an extension of you and being like, okay, 
I'm going to lean forward a little bit and then I'm going to lean back. I'm going to lean forward a little bit and then I'm going to lean back. Yeah. It allows you to enter that intimate space in, in a weird, in a way that doesn't feel too weird. Yes. It might, it might feel weird for you, but definitely not for your audience. Yeah. And I think too, if you can go back to what you said in the beginning, like who are you most comfortable with? Your spouse, your friend, you know, your girlfriend, your, your neighbor, how are you talking to them in real life? Yes. Uh, you know, are you kind of leaning in like, you'll never believe what happened today, right? You, you do different things. How do you challenge, like change that here? I love this. Yes, 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 yes. It, it truly, it's like when you get into charisma hacking yourself, I want you to also pay attention to when you're with people that you don't like, oh. how is your body language? How does your voice change? I call it the customer service voice. And this is what happens when, uh, when you were saying before, like when you meet somebody and they're completely different than they were on camera, and on camera, yes. they're like this big bubbly person. Usually what happens is people fall into one of two categories. It's either the professional persona where they take themselves very seriously and it's a little bit more monotone and it's very toned down or they get into what we call customer service voice where it's like, hi, thank you so much for calling. Oh my gosh, this is so great. It's like the people that you see from high school that you yeah, never Yeah, I get a red like, picture a few of them. What? Oh my gosh, yeah. And I'm like, I never talk like that. But suddenly when you're with yeah. somebody that you are not real with, how does your behavior change? And most likely, if you're trying to be more comfortable on camera, that's the first place you'll go. You'll swing the pendulum in the other direction. And okay. I call it the toothpaste salesman because it sounds like voiceovers I used to do with like, thank you for trying Colgate. Wow. It just, it's, it sounds crazy. So right. if you get into the let's do lunch, then you know you've gone too far. You got to bring it back. Okay. I love it. And I, I really had to tell one of my powerhouses, I have a mastermind and I had to say to them, that video is not you. It was, it was almost like the salesy, like over the top because she was like, but I'm not good enough on camera. So then I have to, and mm -hmm. like, no, 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 you're so good in person. Like yes. just be the same old and it'll work well. Yeah. So good. Now, obviously we want a charisma hack. We want, we want to build that charisma into our videos so that we can be more entertaining, keep them there longer. Right. I obviously assume stop the scroll, keep them there, yeah. but really we want to monetize. We want to convert them into something. Absolutely. So does this tie into monetization or is it just like, let's keep them there as long as we can. And it warms them up more. So 100%. So it does both of those things. So with monetization, um, we really look at two parts of it. Yes, it's making it to the pitch. So the very first client I ever had with Charisma Hacking, they came to me with a webinar that 70% of their people dropped off in the first 30 seconds. And it was like, oh, wow. oh my gosh, that's terrible. So with the very first things that we did, those tweaks, we flipped that and we cut that number down. So it was 30%. And it was like, okay, then where, where can we build from there? Yeah. Right? So it's, it literally lowered her marketing costs by like 20 times. So it was like, okay, we're saving money there. We right. have more people that make it to the pitch that way. The second way is like with, uh, with Facebook ads, it's making sure yes, stopping that scroll, like the highest conversion rate that I've gone for one of my clients is 6%, a click through rate of 6%, which I know sounds low, but that's crazy. Yeah. high, Right. So it's like, okay, making sure that it's entertaining that way. The next thing is with video, video is the easiest way for people to learn um, about you, but it's the easiest way for people to trust you. Mm. And your customers won't buy anything from you if they don't know you and they don't trust you. If all you're relying on is copy, which is just the written part of it, people don't know you. They don't trust you. Yes, they might see it and say, oh, that's exactly what I need and see it before they see one of your competitors and you get lucky that way. But if you're using video and you make people trust you on video by being the most engaging version of yourself, by being authentic on camera, by doing all these charisma hacking things, you create raving fans. And these raving fans are really important because we want repeat viewers. We want repeat listeners. And if you don't have any of those, then your lead gen process or the process of gaining customers never stops. It never stops. And you're always trying to find the next person. But if you can create repeat customers, then yes, lead gen will always be a part of your business, but your costs go way down. They go way down and you're able to monetize those people so much more. They're also much more likely, if you guys know what a value ladder is, they're much more likely to go up your value ladder or to buy higher priced things from you if they trust you. So by using video and by showing your face and showing your personality and doing all these things, they trust you, therefore they buy from you and then they buy from you again yes. and then they spend more money for, with you. 
Yeah, I love that. So a value ladder for those listening, if you aren't familiar, it's basically a product suite. And McCall is saying like they might start small with you and then go up that ladder and purchase more because they feel like that trustworthiness from your videos and warm, being warmed up. Absolutely. So good. Okay, can I ask you, like, what is your biggest pet peeve when you watch people on video? Okay, yes, I have so many of them. Oh my gosh. Uh, I would say, well, it depends on the kind of video. Okay. Uh, one of them, just because we're doing an interview right now, yeah. is so many people, especially if you guys are getting into the interview space, so many people don't look at the camera. <laughs> so it's called, so I call it a small window principle. So, okay. so many people, it's so normal and natural. It feels like what you should do, but you look at the person that's interviewing you. And if you're watching this on yes. video, you can now see me looking at Stacy right here. This is where Stacy is on the camera, which is, which is not the camera. And then <laughs> if you look at the camera, it creates, um, a more intimate relationship with your audience. You yeah. are supposed to be connecting with your audience. So that's one of the things. Um, another thing, ooh, pet peeves on video. I would say, I mean, a lot of times, well, it kind of depends. People who don't move their hands at all sometimes, mm. it's things that make people look unnatural, but yes. I know they're trying. I know they're trying so hard, but if like, if they sit there, oh, 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 oh. Eyebrows. That's my biggest pet peeve. That's what it's gotta be. Uh, if you smile, but you don't move your eyebrows, you look like a serial killer. You look like this. But if you move your eyebrows, your eyebrows are your most expressive part of your face. So if you're looking to just increase the engagement of your facial expressions, because 93% of people watch video without sound first, right? We got them to, we have to get them to click on it before yeah. they even listen to it. So your face has to be animated. Oh. And if you never move your eyebrows and you only move your mouth, you look like a serial killer. So don't do that. <laughs> okay. That's such a good okay. point. So I know we could just keep going. So it's a really great point because you're right. Most people listen to video. They watch the video and they read the captions. They don't even turn you on. Mm -hmm. So if they're watching us, we better look the part, right? M yes. Doing things that look natural so that when they click play, now the sound comes. But really, you're right. It's the look before the sound. Interesting. Yeah. So I have three rules. I, you just have to stop me, Stacey. I geek out so hard on this. But I have three rules of engagement with charisma hacking. The first one is if they were only watching it with no audio, it has to be engaging. The second one is if they're only listening to it and they can't see you, it has to be engaging. And the third one is if they didn't speak the same language as you, they have to be able to get the correct emotional context from it. Mm. Which means if you're talking about something sad and you're like, oh my gosh, today my dog died. And you're like, whoa. Oh, we did not get the right emotional context from that. So with those three things, you will make sure that you're always engaging. So again, I'll say okay. one more time. So no sound, only visual, no visual, only sound. Mm -hmm. And then if they don't speak the same language as you, they have to be able to get the right emotional context. That's from your body, okay. from your voice, from all those kinds of things. So good. Okay. I could spend the rest of the day with you. This has I been know. so good. Nicole, where can people find more about you, more about charisma hacking and all of the good stuff? Okay. So I did something for your audience specifically that I'm actually really excited about. So you guys, 100%, you can join my Facebook group, charisma hacking. It's free. That's awesome. But for this audience specifically, because I'm obsessed with Stacey, I think she's the coolest. It's, oh my gosh, wait, footwork marketing. Wait, foot traffic, this. foot traffic. That's what it is. Okay. So <laughs> I just have to make sure I'm saying the right URL. So if you go to charismahacking.com slash foot traffic, when this comes out, uh, you can sign up to get a free charisma hack from me, which means I will watch your video and I will give you a two minute breakdown of things that I think you're doing right. Things that could make you a little bit more engaging. Um, so that's, that's what we're going to give hey, you. That's amazing. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to do that. You guys go take her really up excited. on that offer. Okay. That's really exciting. And here's the thing. Somebody's not going to do it because they're going to go, I'm ju I, I just know she's going to say I'm horrible or I just know I'm not ready. I'm going to get ready and then I'm going to reach out. <laughs> oh man. What do you say to the girl who's getting ready? <sighs> Guys, if you spend, you will spend your whole life getting ready. I, I promise you, everybody thinks that they're bad on video. And like when you get to the point where you're like, I'm not that bad on video. Then you watch your first video back and you're like, I'm a troll. I hate this so much. It truly like the, the thing that's holding you back from blowing up your business is using video. So the sooner you start, the better you can get. Like totally. I said, charisma hacking is a science. When people say you're either born with it or you're not, they are lying to you. That is not the case. People can be more naturally inclined to be awesome on video, 
but it doesn't mean that there aren't things that you can do. Like I said, it has to do with like speed or vocal pitch. There are literally apps that I have my group coaching programs download that like measures the intervals of their mm. voice. I promise you, you can do this. And the sooner you start, if you feel like you're horrible, the sooner you start and the more tips you get at the very beginning, the better you'll get even faster. Absolutely. <laughs> There's no reason to not get started immediately working on the skill because again, video is not going anywhere. We've talked about this. All right, McCall, you're the best. Thank you so much for showing up and just being <laughs> amazing as I knew you would be. I'm just so, so appreciative much. of you. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I think you're the best. <laughs>